Hello everyone, this is John Buck back with another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. Uh, in this video we're going to talk about sampling and show uh, where the Nyquist theorem comes from. Sampling is a process that we turn a continuous time signal into a discrete time signal. Uh, the process for doing that is that we take the continuous time signal and we sample it periodically in time every capital T seconds and turn those instantaneous values we grabbed as the amplitudes of, of our discrete time signal. Uh, and so the important question then is when do we uh, or when do we have the, enough samples to capture all the information in the original continuous time signal? This is an important sampling is a really fundamentally important process, uh, and it underlies uh, things that are near to and dear to the hearts of many of us, like digital audio or uh, selfies or even this video, uh, which is sampling both the uh, the, the image and the audio at the same time. Uh, when we sample music or speech. We want to sample, get enough samples so that the uh, digitized sound still sounds the same as the original continuous sound or music when I reconstruct it. Uh, and for images, we're just we're sampling because we're going across taking pixels, but right across the image, we want to make sure we have enough pixels that as we sample finely enough in space that the digital image still looks like the uh, person or place or pet that we're taking a picture of. Uh, and so we want to, to capture all the information so that it still looks the same. So in this video, we're going to talk about uh, that process and our basic model for understanding uh, how that works out in the frequency domain, which leads us to understanding how many samples do we need, uh, what kinds of signals can we capture all the information in, and how many samples do we need to do that. Okay, so hopping over to the whiteboard. Again, our main topic for this video is sampling. Uh, again, the idea of sampling is we start with this continuous time waveform, as I've shown here, x of t. And we're going to say that to have a discrete time signal, we're going to grab the value of it. I guess let, let me write the equation down first before I get into the graphical version. We're going to make our discrete time signal x of n to be equal to, we'll call this x sub c for continuous, x sub c at every multiple of some time capital T, where that capital T is what we call the sampling period. We also, related to that, we'll talk about the, in, in radians, the sampling frequency. Which we write as omega sub s is uh, 2 pi over that sampling period, capital T. So this is the sampling frequency in radians that we'll see plays an important role in understanding uh, how samples relate to the original signal. And so we're what this equation says to do is to move along every multiple of capital T, and at that point, we're going to grab the amplitude of the continuous time signal and use that for our samples. This is, is an idealized mathematical representation. In real life, this would be approximated by some implementation like an analog to digital converter or A to D converter sometimes as they're abbreviatedly called. But then we're, we're, our, our hope is that by when we just end up with the blue signal here, oh, so this gives us the amplitudes for the blue signals. And then the last step, right, is this sort of effectively all gets normalized by T. So that when I think of the discrete signal, this would be 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on going backwards this way, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and so on. So they also, the last step, is we renormalize the time axis dividing by t to go from these instants in continuous time little t uh, to discrete integers n, because we know all the discrete time things have to be integers. And so the natural question that we ask ourselves, that we, if we're going to do this, is, is when does x of n contain all the information, contain all the information, in the original continuous time signal x of t. And the answer is from looking at the time domain, it's not obvious that it does. You'd look at these points and say, well, I mean, if it's not changing too fast, I could somehow maybe connect the dots smoothly in some fashion here and get back to the original signals. But it's really not obvious how to do this in the time domain. Look at it and say, yeah, this is fast enough or this one isn't. I have, I have enough values or I don't. And so uh, 
we're going to do when, when, the, when the going gets tough, the tough switch to the frequency domain. And we'll see how to do that in a second with a simple mathematical model of sampling. So we're going to start by modeling the first step of this process. We say, well, what can we do that just grabs the value at one instant? We can use continuous time impulses. Right? We can say, what if I took that continuous time signal and multiplied it by in, did multiplied it point by point in time by this impulse train? Right? What I if I started again with a smooth signal like this, by the time I was done, I'm going to not put it right into blue because because these things are still a different continuous time signal. XP you can see is a function. X of P is still a function of continuous t. But what I would get is each impulse again spaced every uh, t seconds capital t seconds that impulse would have had its amplitude squ uh, scaled by the continuous time signal at this point 0 t 2 t and so now the areas of these impulses instead of just being one like they were originally would be scaled up by I'd have it the area would be equal to x c of t for this one or x c of 2 t here Right, by, by going through that way, multiplying this way, this is a simple mathematical model where I can say that the new uh, pulsed signal, this pulse train signal, is the product of the original continuous xc of t right, which has now become like the, uh, the envelope that scales the heights of these, these pulses from the pulse train p of t. Well, if I want to go to the frequency domain, I say what happens if I'm a uh, good chance to test yourself? If I multiply two signals in time, what happens in frequency? Pause the video for a second, make sure you know. Okay, well, again, it's one of our common uh, Fourier pairs. This is the same even in continuous time as it's been in discrete, which is that if I multiply in time, I convolve in frequency. So that's the this Fourier pair that says I convolve in frequency. And so if I write this in uh, terms of the continuous frequency signal, I'd have 1 over 2 pi. There's a, there's a 1 over 2 pi in front. But it basically says I'm going to convolve the Fourier transform of the original continuous time signal with the Fourier transform of the impulse train. And why that helps me understand what's going on is it turns out the Fourier transform of an impulse train is another impulse train, right? This thing is periodic every t, so it has a fundamental frequency of every 2 pi over t. So if I write it out, there's a, an amplitude factor out front, 2 pi over t, times the, the sum as k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity of a whole bunch of impulses spaced every omega s, where the omega s is that radian sampling frequency 2 pi over t. Right, so if these things are happening every periodically, every t in time, the frequency is 2 pi over the period in time, omega s. And so these impulses and frequency that I'm convolving with, if I plot them on the omega axis, look like this at omega s 2 omega s minus omega s, throwing on the other side, with this, this uh, scaling factor up front says they have area 2 pi over t. Well, now it's time to say, well, whatever this original x of c of t is, it's getting convolved with these impulses. Remember, conceptually, it turns out to work out the same way. If I convolve something with an impulse that's been shifted, what happens in discrete time is the same thing that happens here in continuous time. Right, if, which is that I put a copy of the thing I'm convolving with centered on the impulse. So convolving with a shifted impulse makes a copy of the thing I'm convolving with at the location of the impulse. Right, so that's important to know. So convolving, even in continuous time, convolving with delta of omega minus some k omega s puts a copy of now the original spectrum of the continuous signal, xc of j omega, at omega equals the location of the impulse.
Right, so if I follow that through, what that means is that I'm going to end up with this periodic signal, or this pulse signal has a Fourier transform, will be 2 pi over, I'm sorry, this 2 pi over t and this 1 over 2 pi cancel out. And I'm left with a couple factors here. We have a, a 1 over t, and then I have the second, the other piece I have I'm going to draw in red here, which is these impulses that have been spaced every omega s now become shifted copies of the spectrum of the Fourier transform shifted or replaced every k over omega. So this shift by k omega s in frequency of the impulse becomes a shift of the original signal. And so when I'm doing this process in frequency, I've started out, I have, uh, it turns out there, there are three steps find the uh, discrete, well, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Actually, let's just do the first two to find XP and then we'll come back to the other one at the end. So there's really only uh, two steps to start out with that we need to worry about here. So if you're looking, thinking graphically, two steps to find as xp, I'm sorry, x sub p j omega from x sub c. And I, I sort of color-coded them up above here. Which is to say that for step one, you put copies of xc of j omega every omega s, uh, which is 2 pi over t. So every multiple, right, that's what this says, k times omega s. I'm, I'm shifting copies and then adding them all up on top of each other. Right, so every multiple of 2 pi over t, which is the radian sampling frequency. And then the second thing I do is that I, and this is the less important part, I scale the amplitude by 1 over t. But it's this first step that's the really important one to figuring out when do we have all the information. This last gain is not that essential. It's a bookkeeping detail. But this, this step of putting the copies and looking at the relationship of the copies is crucial to figure out when I have all the information in these samples, even before I rescale the time axis. So this video is long enough. I'm going to stop here, uh, and then I'll go continue in the next video showing how this leads us to the Nyquist sampling theorem. So that's all for Excuse me, that's all for this video. I will uh, pick up in the next one and show how this, this leads us to the information we need or, or the criteria we need to figure out when we have all the information.